course, so. All right, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you're joining us from around the globe. Um, thank you very much for joining us today. Um, we're very excited to have everyone um, here joining us for this um, webinar se uh, session on Innovative Construction Materials for Africa. My name is Shegun Faniran, and I'm the publisher of the Construct Africa platform. For those who don't know Construct Africa, uh, we provide news uh, and analysis on construction infrastructure and the built environment in Africa. And we do that through our website at www.constructafrica.com. Today's webinar is the second in our Building a Better Africa webinar series. And the topic for today's discussion is Innovative Construction Materials for Africa. Bit of housekeeping, during the webinar, you can submit questions through the Q&A function, uh, which you can find at the bottom of the screen. There'll be a Q&A session uh, at the end of the panel discussions, during which panelists will answer um, questions that have been submitted. Uh, during the um, webinar, uh, there will also be poll surveys, which will pop up on your screen as we progress through the webinar. The results of the polls will be displayed periodically um, as we move along uh, through the webinar sessions. Now, without further ado, I'll introduce our distinguished panelists uh, for today's webinar. First is uh, Professor Hussein Mohammed. Professor Mohammed is a professor of civil engineering at the Obafemi Awolowo University in Nigeria. He's an active researcher in the areas of engineering materials, uh, particularly in relation to bituminous road surfaces, and he's published several research papers in this area. Professor Mohammed also uh, undertakes research and is published widely in the areas of operational and performance evaluation of engineering structures. Prof. Mohammed's expertise extends beyond academia and he's provided consultancy and project management services on major infrastructure projects in Nigeria, including, but not, uh, not uh, limited to, the Aqua Ibom International Airport on which he was the project manager. Welcome to the webinar, Professor Mohammed. Thank um, you. The next person is uh, Grace Atieno Odiambo. Grace is the head of design and actually the founder at Cubes and Containers Design, which is an interior design company based in Nairobi, Kenya. Uh, Grace specializes in um, tiny spaces, um, particularly uh, in the conversion of shipping containers into creative living spaces, which include offices, residential accommodation, industrial units, and industrial zones, amongst others. Uh, Grace has a particular dedication to sustainability in both architecture and interior design, and this has been a guiding principle throughout her career. Welcome to the webinar, Grace. Thank you. Uh, next is Dr. Theophilus Shitu. Dr. Shitu is a um, UNESCO Chair in Earthing Architecture, Building Cultures, and Sustainable Development. He also serves on the International Scientific Committee on Earthing Architectural Heritage. Uh, Dr. Shitu's expertise encompasses architecture, architectural technology, construction technology, and construction management. Dr. Shitu is also a senior lecturer and program leader for the BSc Architectural Technology Program at the University of Northampton in the United Kingdom. Welcome to the webinar, Dr. Shitu. Next, we have Ronald Imbu. Ronald is a registered quantity surveyor and construction project manager based in Nairobi, Kenya. He specializes in providing sustainable design and construction services in building and infrastructure projects through the use of sustainable materials and also through the incorporation of biophilic design and natural daylighting. Ronald pu publishes uh, the Building Green Construction Newsletter which is available on LinkedIn and which provides insights on using sustainable products and processes in building construction. Welcome to the webinar, Ronald. Last but certainly not the least, we have with us Charles Malek. Charles is director and partner in charge of structural and bridge engineering at Daryl Handeser. Dar, as um, Daryl Handeser is short into, is a multidisciplinary engineering and infrastructure uh, design and consulting firm. 
and they're headquartered in Beirut, Lebanon. Charles has over 25 years experience leading structural design teams on building and infrastructure projects across the Middle East and Africa. Charles has also championed an innovation agenda at Daryl Handersa, which focuses on using digital technologies such as artificial intelligence and generative design, as well as advanced construction techniques, such as additive ma uh, manufacturing to improve design and construction outcomes. Welcome to the webinar, webinar Charles. Thank you, Dr. Shingan. Great pleasure to be all, with all of you. Thank you. Now, to kick off our um, to kick off today's webinar discussions, um, we're going to start with a keynote presentation, which will be given uh, by Charles. Uh, Charles' keynote presentation is going to be on three D concrete printing uh, with case studies, including um, its implementation in Africa. I will now invite Charles to uh, give his keynote presentation. Thanks. Sorry, I was muted. Um, oh. Yes, I just wanted to say I'll try to briefly, you know, uh, summarize the global experience and where we stand as as a consultancy firm, as DAR, in uh, in the field of three D printing in the construction industry. So, the agenda I'll try to cover is first what is three D printing, what is additive manufacturing, or what we call today more additive construction. The model, the collaborative model that we believe should be set up in place for this emerging technology and construction technique to be to have a successful implementation the evolution uh, throughout the years and and what type of codes and standards do we have today as a reference for this and i'll go through after that um, uh, some of our you know uh, experience in this uh, some of which are collaboration with industry uh, leaders in this field uh, and some others are real application in in the real world with clients all over the area, including one of in uh, one of our clients in Angola, uh, which is more most relevant to the topic of of uh, the the session today, and and some other applications. I will finish with a, a slide summarizing the challenges and the future horizons for this technology. Three D printing or additive manufacturing, and as I said, the terminology is shifting towards additive construction because this is uh, this seems to be more appropriate uh, because at the end of the day we're trying to shift from conventional ways of doing things into a new technique, which is uh, printing by layers. Uh, you know the skeleton of a structure of a certain facility, be it superstructure, a building, or infrastructure. Uh, now, obviously, there are seven mains, uh, seven main benefits and 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 advantages of using three D printing in the construction industry. Uh, first and foremost, and the most important one, is giving the liberty to the architects to innovate to create shapes that would be very difficult, if not impossible, to build using traditional uh, techniques. Uh, the other aspect is really combining and and adding value when when we when we add on the generative design, parametric design approaches, and all those uh, uh, new uh, uh, digitally based uh, tools and, 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 and software that would help generate multiple of solutions and optimize the use of material. Uh, additive manufacturing avoids the need for any formwork and practically eliminates the, co the construction waste, which is a real problem in, in our sites every day. Uh, it needs as well a minimal intervention from from humans and limited site labor. Typically, on a on a, a, a small housing unit, you just need a, a machine operator, a computer operator, to 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 run the machine and 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 the site labor just to make sure that the quality is okay. There are no no hurdles during the process, and obviously the result is a reduction, a significant reduction in time. Sustainability is is obviously another. Uh, add on to this uh, with the opportunity of using green and greener material. And, and obviously, when we talk the wider uh, additive manufacturing uh, industry talks about concrete, but also about other materials like steel and, and polymers, and we'll talk about that. And as a result, we get uh, to a lower carbon footprint uh, construction with higher sustainability scoring.
For this model to succeed and to deliver a significant advantage out of a 3D printed project, you need a client. And, and, and this client would be the champion of this uh, endeavor. Uh, because whenever you want a success, you need a champion. You need someone who believes in innovation, who has also, you know, agenda to deliver quality, uh, value, and time, but, but also ready to invest and, and ready to, to embrace new technologies. For, for a certain client, you know, uh, this model would require a tripod that would make the, the journey a successful one, consisting of a consultant, a contractor and a 3D printing specialist, or we, we call them sometimes technology providers. So this tripod starting from the consultant, which we play the role of uh, during similar projects, uh, the consultant would typically understand the client requirements, the objectives of the project, would have a great knowledge of the authority requirements, the code requirements, the possibilities of 3D printing, uh, as it stands in, 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 in its latest form to deliver any project, what are the constraints and the limitations. And of course, the consultant should have a, a, a significant digital platform to, to create and innovate in shapes and forms and optimization of material utilization and so on. The 3D printing specialist or the uh, technology provider would bring in expertise in the form of the printing tools be it gantry or robotic, and the material science, which goes along with it so that, you know, a certain uh, project can be uh, uh, physically delivered. And you need as well a general contractor, which would uh, deliver the rest of the items of a project, the traditional construction, the logistics, the supply chain, and, 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 and all the rest of the, of the functions. Now, moving into... The timeline, uh, I'll give a snapshot on the timeline, generically speaking, for the concept of 3D printing. Now, in the uh, construction industry, the, the term or the endeavor started in the early 2000s. Before that, uh, the, the period was mostly uh, dedicated or focused on delivering 3D printed medical equipment, medical components, industrial in some cases, and, and, and arts. But it wasn't really uh, focusing, or there was no real focus on the construction industry. The, the, the year 2000, or with the year 2000, the interest started in, in looking at applications or possible applications of 3D printing in the construction industry. And, and from 2000 to 2010, uh, the, generally, the, the period was dedicated to research. Most, most of it was research and the printing technologies and ways and means and what sorts of material. More serious attention was given starting the year 2010 up to 2015, uh, where uh, real work started on you know, developing gantries for, for printing large scale uh, units and, and, and large robotic arms to deliver uh, equally uh, real scale uh, projects or proof of concepts to start with. But all this remained uh, very limited. Beyond 2015, there was more interest in the construction industry with the, of course, uh, uh, interest in, in sustainability, interest in, in reducing construction costs, interest in reaching uh, areas where no skilled laborers are, are there and where, you know, a lot of need in terms of uh, housing uh, exists. So that period 215 up to lately, there were lots of Proof of concepts and demonstrations, and 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 this is when when we 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 saw emerging a lot of uh, you know technology providers uh, all over the world uh, with partner in partnership with 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 interested clients or authorities in that area, and and very recently, as you all read and see, we we see more applications on large scale projects. So that's a snapshot. Now, if we focus on concrete 3D printing, which is mostly the topic of, of our agenda today, uh, concrete 3D printing would require concrete. The evolution from the past 10 years till today is mainly uh, in making the, the mix more and more democratized. By that, I mean, you know, reaching a, a certain mix that could be available or made available or, 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 or produced anywhere in the world. And this is where 
the technology can really spread its 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 uh, breach of of application. So it consists of a cement, typically three fifty kilos per meter cube as a minimum. And as I said initially, they started with no aggregates and a lot of additives. So the mix was more of a mortar. But with time and the evolution and the research, now we reached a, a maximum aggregate size of 12 millimeter, which is practically becoming very close to a normal uh, concrete mix. Uh, the sand is there, uh, similar to any any other um, uh, mix or concrete mix. Water cement ratio has to be limited to 0.5. And of course, we add to this special admixtures, and this is the secret of the recipe, uh, and it depends from, from every technology provider to the other. Uh, each has his own, own type of admixtures, but the aim of the admixture is really to control pumpability, printability, extrudability, and buildability, so that the successive layers gain strength at the right time. They are extrudable in a, in a smooth way, and when laid on top of each other, they remain vertical and they maintain stability. Uh, in terms of the codes and supporting standards in the world, there are very few. Uh, there is, you know, a, a, an endeavor from the International Code Council to deliver AC 509, which gives some guidance around design criteria, limitation in design stresses, quality control, and durability. ISO ASTM have done a great work, and we're in, in relation with them uh, uh, lately uh, in giving support as well. Uh, they have delivered two documents and, and more is yet to come in association with ACI and, and other international institutions. They have developed a lot of uh, quality control uh, and, and, and defining the principles of 3D printing and, and for now giving reference to other available codes for the application. So this is with regard to the... Uh, I, I hope I'm still on schedule. I'll try to be as short as possible, Dr. Shigan, but just let me know if you feel that I'm taking more time. Yes, you're on schedule. You're on schedule. Okay. Fine, fine. Um, very quickly, our experience as a consultant in the field of 3D printing, it started around 10 years ago. Uh, the very initial you know, uh, uh, thoughts and, and focus was on testing some material in the lab, some printability aspects using a, a very small gantry uh, printer but then we tested a lot of uh, we did a lot of desk studies we tested on some cases for clients in the gulf and in parallel with that uh, we had a successful collaboration with an industry leader uh, which is autodesk we delivered th through this uh, collaboration two prototype bridges they were very successful uh, ones which we'll talk about uh, uh, shortly after and, and we've done some other interesting structures, one in the Netherlands and, and currently we're doing one in Angola. So we'll talk quickly about all of those. The collaboration with Autodesk, as I mentioned, was a breakthrough. And, and the idea here was not just to print or 3D print another structure or another bridge. We wanted this to be an ecosystem, to create an ecosystem, starting from the very initial point where we, 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 we bring in the ideas so we, we had a lot of input from generative design tools uh, to develop, you know, given certain sets of constraints and limitations, uh, a certain type of structure. And, 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 you know, the outcome of this was to 3D print a two meter pedestrian bridge out of uh, fiber reinforced polymers, not concrete this time. Uh, and we'll talk about this aspect as well. And, and, and this had received the award of excellence for the best collaboration with the industry in 2021. The, the main features of this uh, two meter smart bridge, we called it the smart bridge because of its inherent uh, smart features. Uh, we started initially using the generative design tool of Autodesk and the generative design based on set of constraints and limitation and architectural requirements and aesthetical aspects delivered thousands of solutions. Uh, based on those multiple number of solutions, our structural team had to deliberate and, and, and you know, using a multi-criteria analysis, reaching a, a minimum number of, of uh, you know, best solutions. And, and those were derived at the end to reach a single solution that would represent the most efficient uh, one using the least quantity of material, just putting the right material at the right place. So all what you see as organic shapes are voided sections. 
and they were 3D printed using, as I said, polymer, uh, polymer material, polymer reinforced fibers. Uh, and, and, and the bridge as a final stage was designed using a finite element model to get to the, to the image that you see, which was displayed in one of the exhibits in Dubai two years ago. Now, what's smart about this bridge? First, as I said, the process of creating, creating it using generative design and parametric design tools was, was the important and, and one of the most uh, uh, innovative item about it. The other one is the amount of embedded sensors. So we had over 80 sensors embedded inside and around the sections. And the, the, the purpose of those sensors are to uh, be continuously linked uh, with with uh, with a system that would uh, continuously monitor the health and sensors were related to stress strain uh, uh, dynamic performance deflections and and so on and those were feeding into a, a digital twin model of the bridge so we had continuously data feeding in and the objective of this is to of course immediately sense the health of the structure in case there are any uh, deficiencies anywhere but also to inform future designs. And this is where we really close the circle and we, we create an ecosystem. So we design, we monitor, we get feedback and we improve future designs based on the feedback we get. Uh, the second stage of collaboration with, with Autodesk was, was a more daring bridge, which is a, a five meter one against the two meter in the first phase. And the material itself is, is recycled and, and recyclable. So that was a step further in terms of sustainability. It uses 30% uh, uh, glass fiber and is, is a polymer, as I said, based material using post-industrial uh, plastics. Uh, so the five meter bridge embedded also sensors and the, the, the innovation here is, is also related to the cross-section. So there were lots of studies in terms of what is the most efficient cross-section for the infill material? How do we gain the required strength? How do we gain the required stiffness for, for human comfort and serviceability while using the least material uh, and amount of material? And we ended up you know, testing a lot of, of, of those cross-sections to reach the best one, which is the gyro. And the gyroads, as you see on the screen and on, on the bottom left and, and right, uh, uh, mimics the, the 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 composition or the section of the human bones, and and that was a very interesting uh, finding at the end of the day, because we reached a very efficient, very printable as well, because we were worried about the printability and the practical practical aspects of printing such cross section, but ultimately it proved to be the lightest, the most efficient, and the easiest in printing. These are pictures showing the, the bridge with the embedded sensors and the you know, monitoring uh, uh, devices that were installed. And this is the final bridge that was displayed in Autodesk University in September, 2022. I'll move to concrete applications. This one is the Qatar Pavilion for the uh, uh, Floriade Expo 2022 in the Netherlands. We called it the desert nest, and this typically, uh, you know, replicates the the, the, the pigeon nest uh, type of structure we find in, in the Gulf region. But it is made uh, out of uh, pre-printed uh, or, 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 you know, factory printed segments that were assembled on site. So all of it is really an assembly, is made out of an assembly of uh, pr uh, printed segments in the in the in the factory and and erected interlocked on site uh, the other application uh, relates to uh, a landscape project where we delivered uh, also uh, uh, cladding elements that were 3d printed in the factory and and installed uh, on site this particular project remained at the concept stage where we wanted to explore the upper bound of um, applicability of 3D printed non-reinforced elements because as you know, the challenge remains in 3D printing um, uh, to, to how to incorporate reinforcement. For now, this remains a challenge, although there are attempts yeah. to resolve this. But um, uh, we wanted to explore what 3D printed Printed concrete can best deliver, which is a compression-only structure. So, okay. 
uh, we have envisaged this, we have analyzed it numerically, but uh, the project did not move forward. It, re it remained at the concept stage. This is a real scale application, an ongoing one in Angola, where we are uh, partnering with a local technology provider to deliver uh, housing units. As we speak, this is uh, an ongoing project. It uses concrete as a printing material as well. I've, I have intentionally shaded this because these are confidential projects we cannot talk much about. They are uh, happening as we speak in the Gulf region. And we have carried out also some material testing uh, on 3D printed element to correlate with the analysis and to ensure that the final products are meeting the code requirements. Uh, my last slide will show the challenges and what we believe uh, are the future horizons for this new and, and, and emerging construction technology. Obviously, as I said, the main challenge remains to integrate reinforcement so that we can scale up this technology and, and, and look at applications in the field of high-rise buildings, in the field of long-span structures. Uh, the second challenge and, 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 and where there is an area to improve is also how do we 3D print horizontal elements because all the applications or most of them uh, we see around relate to vertical wall construction in the construction industry. Uh, the third and, and, and important also area where we believe there should be more work and more focus and more support from, from all the relevant stakeholders are the codes and standards. And, and uh, as we speak, there are, as I said, very few codes and standards that support. In lots of cases, we refer back to uh, codes related to relating to, to, to designing, analyzing and designing masonry structures or plain concrete structures. Uh, although in some cases we 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 add some fibers to the to the mix so that we improve the tensile strength and capacity of the mix, but this is not enough. And, and there is a lot to be done also at the code and codification level. And as I said, uh, ASTM and, and ACI are showing great interest and there are tracks already uh, ongoing for, for developing more, more tailor-made codes for this technology. Uh, also, the, the, the limitations we have today in the, in the gantries and robotic arms, be it in terms of geometry, reach, and, and heights, uh, is a factor that needs to be further developed by the technology providers. And above all, we need clients who are willing to invest in, in, in money to, to, to start with so that we can start generating uh, revenues out of this technology. But I'm sure, you know, 3D printing is here to stay in the construction industry. It has a potential, uh, you know, bright future. We don't know yet to what extent it can uh, replace the conventional techniques, but, but I'm sure it is progressively gaining more grounds. As far as DAR is concerned, we're, we're uh, widening our partnership with, with uh, interested clients who are the champions of those uh, new projects and its industry players and, and technology providers all over the area so that we can explore more opportunities and grow this uh, type of emerging technology uh, to, the, to the best interest of our societies. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Charles. Uh, that was a very uh, informative, insightful, and yeah, very interesting um, presentation. Um, the plan before was to have all the panelists um, sort of comment, but we've, we've, we're kind of running over time. So what I'm going to do right now is to ask um, two panelists who might want to comment. Um, are there any two particular panelists who might have something to comment on what Charles has said? Well, we don't seem to have. Oh well, uh, Professor Mohammed has. I'll I'll go first, Professor Mohammed, since we said two and nobody has, so I'll be one of the yeah. two. Um, okay. Um, you you said that um typically these three D printing projects um come up um with clients as uh the champions of of the use of the technology. Um, I'm just wondering in the um example you gave in Angola, for example, um where you where you are three D. 3D printing up um some some structures there. Um yeah. was there was there any input, for example, from the design team um in terms of what did you say? was there any input from the um yeah. sorry, excuse yeah, me, sorry. Sorry. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. yeah. Was there any input from the from the design team to the client in terms of a recommendation for any particular reason? I mean, could be sort of cost, could be logistics, could be uh, speed of construction or something 
um, or, 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 or what was the rationale for the client? Do you know what the rationale, the client's rationale was in championing, apart from wanting to be a technology champion? Yeah, um, on this particular project, uh, Dr. Shigan, uh, uh, our, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, involvement started with the technology provider who approached initially the client. The client um, uh, uh, is a public authority and they're interested in, in, in you know, uh, supplying the demand in terms of housing uh, uh, units and so on. So the idea was really to, to deliver a first proof of concept on a certain limited number of units so that they can ultimately assess the, uh, the advantages. Time advantages are clear, uh, but the idea is to see how much it will cost at the end of the day so that they scale it up on larger projects but obviously the interest was in time uh, and and to supply uh, the, the the high demand in terms of uh, housing needs okay all right thank you professor mohammed you had a comment you you're, you're muted um let me see can i okay can you hear me yeah i can hear you now yeah You're muted again. We cannot we cannot hear you. You're, you're muted again. You're, you're muted again, Professor Mohammed. Yeah. Okay. okay, can you hear me now? Yeah, yes, yes. We can we? Hear you. Yes. Yes. I really excited about the presentation. I noted the uh, elimination of uh, or reduction in construction waste. That's what I uh, quite uh, observed. Yes. Yes. And I I also noted that uh, you talked about providing fibers for to reinforce to act as reinforcement because you cannot you can you cannot sustain tensile stresses because there are no reinforcement. When we have done a lot of my colleagues and myself, we do a lot of uh, research on using uh, materials as either as additive or as partial replacement in concrete, which could, which could uh, 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 include, which could prefer, prefer tensile uh, properties on the material. So that, because you talked about fibers, using fibers, because we have done quite some research on using coconut fibers, using rice, rice, uh, rice uh, horse, Rice, uh, husk, and all that. In fact, in our many in in previous years or periods, in fact, in our local in our villages, our our, our um, clay, the clay they use in building our houses, they usually add some straws, and we discovered that it uh, enhanced the strength of the of, of of the materials and make the the houses the last quite long there are very many in uh especially in the southern part of the, of the country like Akwaibon and all that i've practically i've physically seen them so i'm really excited about uh, this thing i want to ask is it possible we you do do printing using asphaltic concrete i want you to look at that because it's a fast thing Asphaltic concrete, 3D printing. Asphaltic yeah, I mean, concrete. Sorry. That's, yes. that's an interesting that's idea, all. of course. But you know, the 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 critical aspect would be uh, the the pumpability because the process throughout uh, which you 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 get the concrete out of the nozzle has to go through a pump, has to go through a you know a certain system, uh, and 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 the difficulty here is to ensure the flowability of the mix of the of the of the concrete that is flowing. Uh, that would deliver uh, strength at the end of the day without disrupting the, the pumping process. So uh, to my knowledge, this has not been tested. It can be looked at. That's that's something of interest. In addition to the other aspect you mentioned, which is using organic uh, natural uh, fibers. But obviously, all this has to go through testing process for mainly for pumpability. And th this is what, in my opinion, would, would be the critical aspect in in delivering, you know, a good end result. Thank you. All right. Thank, thank you thank very you. much, Charles. Thank you very much, Professor Mohammed. Um, we will now go on to the next segment. Um, we're running slightly over time. Um, so we're going to sort of um 
try to adapt as much as possible. Um, in our next segment, we're now going to look at um, an overview really of construction materials um, in Africa, uh, but sort of starting from the um, from first principles of construction materials. So we're going to look at it from the um, planks of availability, affordability, uh, the suitability of the materials, as well as uh, sustainability. So I'll, I'll just kick off right now by um, asking sort of a generic questions in terms of uh, the what the panelists uh, observe or their opinion on the key developments and trends uh, they've observed regarding the availability and affordability of construction materials in Africa. And I'll be starting with Dr. Uh, Shitu. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Fanyan. Um, so what we are talking about um, availability of construction material in Africa, first of all, the first thing that comes to mind is affordability. Um, the, um, Africa is blessed with so many kind of uh, construction mat material. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, concrete is an alternative because we have, the, I mean, the basic raw material for um, concrete is cement. And we have vast reserve of um, limestone, which is the principal uh, material for uh, cement. And we also have other uh, local materials, for example, earth. Um, a lot of materials, timber and everything, we have it. But the issue is um, affordability. And when we talk about affordability, uh, it's not only about cost. It's about the knowledge. And that is where uh, policy is very important. Um, issue about support from all sides. Because um, we cannot afford to be building the same way we are building 30, 40 years ago. I mean, when I left Nigeria, Nigeria population 100 million. Now it's double. Probably in the next five years it will be 300 million. From, I mean, from 100 million, we are now 200 million plus. On the same land, um, and resources for building is not infinite. Okay, as we are using it, we cannot replace most of them. So, how do we now look at um, um, meeting the people's need, uh, meeting the power today's needs without um, uh, jeopardizing the future needs? We all need. Um, construct. I mean, we need to continue construct constructing uh, buildings. We need to um, for that. Uh, I mean, maybe maintain the existing ones. So, how do we all do that? Uh, we have to look at ways in which we can make uh, our construction affordable. So, affordability is the key thing uh, when it comes to the. In terms of availability, we have all uh, one of this. When Charles was presenting um, his 3D um, model, he mentioned one critical thing, which is the same as um, um, earth construction, which, I mean, we all know that earth material is very good material, but it's very low in tension. Um, but what do our forefathers do? They now use the compressive strength to compensate the tensile strength. So in the same way, we can use that technology. We can use that same system. I mean, our forefathers have built three, four-story buildings with art, and some of them are still existing today. The Gobara Minaret is about five-story building. It's about 300 years old, and it's still existing. So there are a lot of things we can do. So th um, Charles, thank you very much for your presentation. I think we can collaborate. Here in the UK, we are already looking at, uh, in my university, we are looking at ways we work, how we can do 3D print with art using COP. Mm -hmm. So let me stop here. Um, I, I believe um, other panelists would like to add to that. All right, thank you very much, Dr. Shitu. Um, I'm going to come to the other panelists, but I want to ask a specific question. Perhaps they can sort of, maybe sort of zero in on that question. What construction materials are in most demand and sort of most widely used in Africa? That might sound like a very general question, but I still will be interested to hear from the panelists what the answer to that is. And how available are they generally? Are they produced locally? You know, um, are they mainly imported into Africa, for example? Um, are there any issues? Are they available from other African countries? Maybe some African countries have some, some don't have some, that sort of thing. Um, I'll call on Ronald. Um, 
who is um, from Nairobi, Kenya. Maybe perhaps you can give us some insights from your um, consultancy work. Um, so to answer your question, um, three materials come to mind in terms of availability. Definitely there's concrete, uh, there's also clay, and there's also timber. Uh, particularly uh, in the case of timber, timber is not, let me take a case in point of Kenya, timber is not generally available in Kenya, but it's regionally available in Uganda and Tanzania and even DRC Congo. So in that regard, it is available. Um, on a more general level, I believe the availability question is also pegged on two matters. Uh, this is in relation to uh, extraction to end of product period. So if you are to take, for example, things like masonry warning, it has very little um, processes from the extraction to the end product that's being used. And that's widely available. But when you look at particularly finished products, if let's say, uh, let's take uh, concrete for instance, um, using the example of cement, in as much as we have large reserves of limestone within Kenya and within the sub-Saharan uh, region, we end up importing loads of it in the form of clinker. And that extensively drives up the cost, making it, making it less affordable to the masses. Yeah. All right, thank you very much, um, Ronald. Uh, Grace, do you have any comments to add? I think you're on mute, Grace. Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. So for me, if I'm to consider what is readily available in sorry, to... sorry, Grace, could you increase your volume a bit? Can can hear you. I don't know if it's better now. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So in regards to sustainability and availability of materials, uh, as Ronald has said. Some of the materials are not as available in Kenya uh, as opposed to other countries. Now, in my in my field of specialization, which is the shipping containers, you'll realize that it is uh, one of the materials that is considered as a sustainable alternative to construction, but it's not very uh, uh, readily available in some of the countries. Out of uh, the countries in Africa, you'll find shipping containers are mainly found in seven countries, South Africa being the top, then followed by Nigeria, then Egypt, then Kenya, followed by Morocco, Algeria, and finally Ghana. So you'll find the use of shipping containers as a building material will only apply in these countries to make it affordable to their citizens in regards to solving some of the construction issues. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Grace. Um, I'll just pretty much round up this session, this particular area of availability and affordability. Um, I'll call on Professor Mohammed. Um, we've talked about a lot of sort of the key construction materials. Um, Professor Mohammed has indicated that they've done quite a fair bit of research into alternative construction materials. Um, perhaps you might want to say okay. one or two, Professor Mohammed, about these, your alternative construction materials and your research findings. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, the predominant materi material in Nigeria that's required now for construction is cement. Now, even though we have deposits of limestone, but the, we do not have the capability to produce enough cement for the infrastructural development now is, is not very good. In fact, as of this morning, I bought a bag of cement for 11,000 naira. That's close to $10, 11,000 naira. So uh, the need now for us to, to look into alternative or substitute uh, becomes imperative. And I said, in our universities, as well in my university here, we've done a lot of research. So all you need to do is to, for us to upload them, how we can have uh, like con, uh, con cob hash, uh, like uh, even pet, using pet, coconut fiber, um, 
uh, rice wants to ask, consigned clay, these, we have done a lot of research that this can be either a substitute or partial replacement as for cement in the construction industry. I want to tell you the, the, we, the construction activity in the country is, a, is really high and it's required because the population is growing and continuously we need to improve our facilities. In fact, I want to tell you that there are some, some of us, like our university here, the, some of the infrastructures, don't, like the roads, for example, were probably built like 50 years ago. And the population has since changed. So we have a lot of, so the need, so the construction will continue. And the need for us to assess uh, the site findings, providing alternative materials for construction is very, very necessary. So we have the capability. You can check Google. If you Google many of our scholars in this university, you see there are research findings on alternative materials for construction, either as uh, partial replacement, either as additive, and many other things. So that's it. I think we need it. Thank you very much. All right, thank you. Just a quick comment on what you said, Professor Mohammed, and this follows on from one of the questions that somebody has already raised, um, which I'll be passing on to you later. But um, it might be useful for if you have some some sort of compendium of your research work and research findings, um, which you sort of make available. Um, if that might be something you might want to look at within your sort of school or your research center. Um, and that, um, and there's several people I, th I think actually on this call even that would be very interested in those findings, um, apart from elevating it to the level of industry um, and government. So if there's some sort of compendium, some sort of collation of your research work, yeah, yeah, I, and, I that, can, and that's I can, on the department yeah. as well, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yes. Number one, many of these, many of these things that are in the Google Scholar, but we have research uh, committee in the university. So I will liaise mm -hmm. with them and if and so can goes to you, if you can find a way of uploading some of these research findings that could yes. assist, I will I will list the, the committee and get back okay. to you. All right, thank you very much. All right, now we're going to go into the uh, and look at the issue of the suitability of the materials that are available, um, and essentially. Um, I'm posing this question to the panelists: that uh, do you consider that the construction materials currently uh, being used, um, are they actually suitable for Africa, um, considering the specific sort of climate, climatic issues, socioeconomic conditions, you know, maintenance requirements, um, et cetera, et cetera? Um, I mean, are there any particular issues you see? Um, maybe they're fantastic, they're, they, are, um, they are suitable for Africa, but just what are your comments on that? I'll start, in, I'll start in again with Dr. Shitu. Um, what's your comment on that? Yeah. Um... In Africa today, it's not about um, whether it's, uh, I mean, it's not about um, the convenience, whether it's suitable or not. It's about, um, first of all, we talk about our affordability and durability is the next thing. Uh, why is concrete so much used today uh, in Africa? It's because it's very durable. Is that been tried and tested is durable. And we know cost of delivery of construction in Africa is private driven. Um, let me talk about West Africa. As far as I'm aware, because I know much about West Africa, there is no country in West Africa that they have good mortgage. So even housing, you have to uh, uh, save the money and then be able to build it on, on your own, which is not easy. So when you have to invest your life savings, you go for something that is tried and tested. But there are other alternative materials that are equally good. But because people are not so sure of it, nobody, I mean, no private individual will go on trial for his uh, project. They, everybody will go for something that is very durable. And that's why concrete is widely used. But there are other materials which um, probably towards the, at the end of this, uh, uh, towards the end, I will show you some slide of some of my project in Nigeria. 
that we use it earth in Nigeria, which some people would never, some people would say it's a burnt bricks. They are burnt bricks, but they are earthy material. But why? Because just like uh, Charles said, um, a good innovative project is client driven. We are fortunate at that time to have rich clients that help us, that that's, I mean, backed us. But they are not readily available. They are not many, they are very few. So coming back to Professor Mohammed, um, um, well done, I mean, for your research. I, uh, somebody posted the link there, and I'm, as we are discussing, I'm reading your work. But another thing that we encourage you to do is about reaching out. Um, we, we have to start thinking of partnership with private individual and private organization there. I mean, look at how much they are spending on Big Brother Niger. You understand? So if we in the economics reach out, there are people there, although they are very full, that will start spending. And you know, it's just about getting one good result. You know how our people work. By the time you will get one good result, people will queue in to come to us. That is, but we have to reach out now. So probably maybe I'm deviating, but it's still part of it. But um, what I'm trying to say is that um, we have a lot of materials that can be used. That, have been tried, that, have been, that can be used, but the issue is that uh, it has to be tried and tested for people to really be able to invest on it. I know when I was promoting use of earth in material in Nigeria, people said there is even one colloquial word which the Nigerians say we know, koto koto. You want me to build my house with koto koto, you know, that kind of earth. It's more like that, it's a derogatory word for earth material. And so, until they see it in real life, people see it before they start using it. There are lots of materials which you can use. Bamboo is another very good material uh, that we can use. Um, we have timber, although our forest is diminishing, but with good uh, forest management system, we can still, uh, uh, timber is another alternative material we can use. And of course, even the concrete itself, we've seen an, a good innovation from Charles on 3D printing, um, uh, using concrete and other um, materials that we can think about. So there are a lot of um, alternative material, but we need support. I mean, if we need to move forward, there should be support from government, from, uh, I mean, there should be a policy in place to support innovation in the construction industry for us to be able to try and test our material to see how good it is. We can see, I mean, from the chart on the journey of 3D printing up to where we are today. Years and years of publication, test and trial and error and everything from where we are today. Okay. In the next 10 years, we don't know how, where we'll become. Probably it's a journey of maybe about 30 or 40 years to come before we reach there. And who will finance that? No private individual that are struggling to end, make end meet. Thank you. But thank you very much, Dr. Shitu. Um, I'm going to call on Charles. Uh, do you have any comments on problems with current materials? Any yeah. Suitability? yeah. Actually, from our experience, um, obviously, concrete remains the most versatile, the most, uh, you know, uh, used material in the construction industry in Africa and 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 probably to some extent elsewhere because of its ease of production, because of its availability uh, in terms of production, practically locally, locally everywhere. Uh, but, you know, there are issues downstream in the process and, and, and some of them are really related to quality uh, control, to consistency in the production. Uh, this is the sort of issues we face. And, and also what we face um, it's a certain limitation in terms of the strength we can achieve in some African countries uh, due to, to the quality of the cement to start with, the composition of the cement, and the fact that, you know, you need to import some of the uh, mixed constituents so that you, you get higher strength in terms of additives, re cement replacement material. So this is what's really hindering, um, let me say, uh, the, the the maximization of, of the benefits of the concrete or what concrete can deliver today to the construction industry. 
Uh, now to the to the other side of uh, the question relating to what other materials obviously as i said in my presentation we believe this is an area where a lot of research should should still happen should take place in africa i can mention uh, you know a lot of ideas related to how can we re use more of what is available on the ground you know why don't we 3d print using sand and these are the type of questions we, we're asking ourselves and, and we're asking our partners in the industry, the technology providers. Uh, we, we did some research on that, but eventually this is a bit far-fetched today, uh, but but it can be, a, 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 you know, in the near future, you know, there could be a horizon on this. Uh, but, but obviously it needs focus, it needs uh, financing, and it needs a lot of testing and, 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 um, uh, unless all this is done, we, we may not see except some some experimental trials, uh, not much more. Okay, yeah. Thank you very much. Um, I know we're we're kind of um sort of running out of time, but I, I know that Professor Mohammed has um done some work on you know the issue of concrete um versus uh bituminous asphalt in Nigeria. Um, some people might be aware, but um. Um, sometime last year or the year before, I'm not quite sure when it was. No, it was last year actually, because it's the current minister for works in Nigeria um, instructed um, that um, they replace um, the materials for um, roads. You know um, that rather than using um, asphaltic surfaces, that they should replace it with concrete. Um, and there was a whole debate around that. You know all the issues surrounding that. First of all, whether the material was suitable. Then the other contractual issues surrounding with contractors midstream or midway in a project sort of stopping and then you know, changing the materials and all that. Um, and um, Professor Mohammed actually um, wrote a whole paper where he addressed the issue. Um, I think that the link to that paper, which we published as well, um, was put in the chat box um, just now. Um, because we're running out of time, yeah, there, yeah, there's a there's a link to it right there in the chat box, actually. Um, because we're running out of time, um, uh, I think maybe I'll just refer people just to, to that, really. Um, I don't know if you want to say something just very, very briefly about that, Professor Mohammed, but just very, uh, very, very brief, briefly. Very briefly, very yeah, briefly. Yeah. Now, I, for me, for to ensure sustainable development in use of materials, yeah. I had mentioned to you that we need to, and to, convince, to also convince people, it has to be what we call quality assurance. I'm sure once there's quality assurance, not just the quality control. Yes, there'll be control, but I'm not sure we engage in quality assurance. But if we do quality assurance, in my in my and so we ensure that it's properly done and people will be encouraged. I built my first house with mud. So on um, as if it's the, if it's the for me when they ask me concrete versus asphalt, I just told them the answer is yes and no. So I cannot yes and no. So it depends. On the life cycle cost of materials, which include initial construction costs, maintenance and repair costs, and many other things. So there should be a life cycle analysis before you take a decision on whether you want to use asphalt or you want to use uh, concrete. Environmental, uh, environmental area, environmental condition play also, will also play a large part in such a decision. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Um, I'll call on um, Ronald um, to comment on this issue, just generally in terms of the suitability of materials, if you have any comment on it. Um, yeah, I think a key issue on the suitability has to do with the lack or little number of standards and regulations around it. Um, taking the example of uh, I know Dr. Shitu talked about suitability is all dependent on durability. Um, I had mentioned earlier in relation to something on clay. So for instance, uh, the Western parts of Kenya easily and have knowledge around this area tend to um, transport masonry materials from the other region of Kenya, which is about 300 kilometers away, instead of using the earth blocks that are within the area purely because they have not been tried and tested. And uh, that's where our standards and that's where certifications and such kind of things come up to ease in the process and to uh, enable um, 
such materials to be used. Yeah. All right. Thanks, um, Ronald. Uh, Grace, do you have any comments on this issue of uh, suitability? Yes. Uh, when I look at suitability, I also look at the demographics of the target audience of these solutions that we, or these innovations that we're trying to, to think of. As I've mentioned, in terms of shipping containers, you look at all these options you're mentioning, they don't have one factor or one characteristics that a shipping container has, and that is portability. In Kenya, we look at construction or housing to be targeted to a certain age group, maybe from 35 or 40 all the way to the late 60s. So there is a group that is marginalized in terms of uh, getting housing solutions. And in Kenya, we also have what we call urbanization, where at a certain age, we all move to the big cities to work for a while, then much later in our age, we retire to our rural areas. So you'll find shipping container is the only option that allows you to think of uh, building or investing in housing in the urban setting where you are for the period that you'll be there. Then when it's time for you to move to the rural areas as it is our norm, you can move with your house. But most cases you'll find at the moment, you have to look at two uh, houses. You have to look at a house in the urban setting where you spend a few years in, then much later you have to think of constructing another house back at home. So we look at uh, availability of resources as you progress in your age and how easy it is for you to build two houses. You end up with most people who have houses in, uh, for this instance, Nairobi, but when you go back to their rural homes, they have nothing to show for it, you know? So shipping container tends to give this solution and I would recommend it for especially the young. You can now start thinking, you can now start uh, inviting them to discussions of housing and investments and, uh, access to housing with this option because they can do something it's like an adult lego you build according to your need if your current need is a single person's housing you build what a single person needs when your uh, needs grow you grow with it when it's time for you to reduce your footprint you can easily do that we also realize we have a lot of people who have five bedroom, six bedroom house that in their old age, they cannot even maintain. So we end up having very beautiful houses in rural areas that are only visited once, one week in a year, which tends to be a, a waste of investment. All right, thank you very much, Grace. Um, I'll now quickly move on to the issue of sustainability um, in relation to construction materials. Um, I mean, we're all aware that sustainability is a very topical issue currently. Um, it's important, as we know, for preserving our planets, reducing pollution, conserving natural resources like water and air. Um, only recently, there was the COP20 conference in Dubai, um, where lots of money was pledged by governments around the world to address issues of climate change and sustainability. Um, we're just going to touch briefly on this, because I think it's important that we consider this issue um, as part of the discussion today. Um, I'm going to really sort of direct this um, to Ronald, uh, being a sort of resident um, sustain sustainability consultant, um, 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 as well as Grace, but I'll start with Ronald. So in construction, we hear a lot about green materials. Um, what are green materials and what's the difference between green materials, you know, and sustainable construction? Is, is it the same thing or do we just toss those words around, you know? Um, I'm starting with Grace. Sorry? Am I the one starting with Grace or Ed? Oh, well, I'll start from Ronald and then we'll go on to Grace here. Oh, okay. Yeah, so uh, to simply put it, uh, green materials are those uh, that are less harmful to the environment in terms of extraction and where it's being used. Um, on the other hand, uh, sustainable, sustainable materials in my opinion, are those uh, materials that offer a holistic view. So they take into consideration the social, the economic call and the environmental parameters. And um, um, 
it's it's quite common to hear a lot of people use both terms interchangeably but green materials has more focus on the environmental aspect while like i say the sustainable materials are more holistic all right thank you grace any so according to how i understand and i will try explain it in the uh, easiest of terms uh, green materials for me refer to materials that have low impact to to the environment and they tend to create a more a more comfortable environment for users uh, you're looking at uh, its quality of uh, would i say effect to the ozone layer its replenishment and how the quality of air that we basically get from the materials that we build when you look at sustainability then it's more focused on the material you'll be getting after a few years will it still be something that will still be readily available and also in terms of uh, impact to the environment how what's the impact at that particular time and what will be the impact a few years later so say in comparison to 10 years what will be the effect of these materials to the environment okay thanks grace um dr Shita, i'm going to ask you the question why really should we be thinking of sustainability when we are selecting construction materials? I mean, shouldn't the shouldn't we just be focused on um, costs, you know, and what what's available, and just sort of go ahead and use it? Why should sustainability be a factor? Well, the simple answer is we cannot afford not to think of it. And why? Because, um, I mean, materials are becoming more and more scarce and the demand is becoming more and more. So there is scarcity, there is demand in on one side. And we still, I mean, we have to do something about it because um, I mean, apart from food and clothing, for example, housing is the next thing we need. So it's something that we cannot do without it. But we know the challenges facing us, the environment. Um, we cannot use all the resources we have to construct buildings that will require more energy, for, for example, to make it comfortable. I was in Nigeria last April and a friend invited me to their house. And that was, you know, if you could remember, that was during the scarcity of Naira and everything this and that. And the fuel finishing generator the building was absolutely boiling. I mean, within one hour, everybody was sweating inside the house. So the concrete we are using required a lot of energy to sustain, to, uh, to make it habitable. So that is another thing. So even if we can afford it, uh, the concrete, we have to maintain it. And maintaining fuel is becoming more, I mean, they've reduced, uh, they removed subsidies on fuel in Nigeria. So that means um, we have to spend more money uh, because of epileptic power supply to fuel our generator and all this is. Or we have alternative materials that we can use that we eliminate the use of uh, um, um, air conditioning in our homes, for example. So those are the things. So in terms of even affording the house and maintaining it, it required us to think uh, alternative means, sustainable means of uh, uh, construction. And then the impact of unsustainable practices on the environment, on our survival as humans, is very huge. Construction is the largest emitter of carbon to the atmosphere, and we need to do something about it. A recent survey said that if 50% of um, if there is 50% in reduction in construction industry of carbon in construction industry, 50% of climate issue will be solved. I think I agree with that. Okay, thank you very much, um, Dr. Shitsu. We'll round off, um, well, sort of getting towards the rounding off our discussion on sustainability. I'm, I'm just going to ask Ronald, because um, we've had a discussion on this before. Um, going beyond current practices, how can the construction industry further adopt sustainability, you know, um, 
if I want to correct practices anyway, apart from selecting sustainable materials, but do you, do you just want to shed some lights on how the construction industry can um, adopt sustainability? I think you're, you're on mute. You're on mute. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you for telling me yeah. that. Um, yeah, um, I, I like what the Dr. Sheet talked about, like if you were to reduce uh, um, how much, um, if you're to pay attention to the construction industry, then we will drastically reduce uh, the carbon footprint and everything like that. But um, to take it a notch higher, um, I think we should pay more attention to restoring and remediating what has already been lost rather than reducing um, on what we are currently doing. So this is where uh, something called regenerative sustainability comes uh, to place rather than seeking to just uh, go in like net zero or just um, thinking of ways to just reduce the amount of carbon emissions that are being emitted uh, since the construction industry is highly energy intensive, we can actually look for ways of being net positive. For example, like the way we talk about Bhutan and their tree cover, and it's the only net positive nation in the world. So we need to integrate and incorporate more regenerative practices rather than just leaving sustainability as a matter of reducing harmful activities. Yes. Okay, thank you very much, Ronald. Um, just before we get into the final segment where we're going to be looking at recommendations and sort of vision for the future, I just want to call on Dr. Shitsu. Um, I know he has some specific um examples or slides or something you wanted to show. I don't know if yeah, um, yeah. yeah. We we yeah. we have yeah. limited time. Um yeah. sorry yeah. to sorry, um, sorry to restrict you, but um yeah. It's just pictures to show you some of my buildings. Um, that, yeah. um okay. Can you see my screen now? Yeah. Okay, good. Okay. So um uh, when we talk about earth construction, um, generally people will say it's for the poor, it's not durable and everything. It's what you are seeing on the screen here is uh was built between 1997 and 98. And in August 2022, I was there to look at the building, and it's still immaculate. Uh, uh these are different views from the from the from the site. Um, this is the interior of the building, and this is um, the uh, during construction some of the photograph. Unfortunately, what during the construction uh, we are still using the analog camera, so it's not as clear as the digital camera. Um, this is construction phase. Uh, this is around January, I think February nineteen ninety eight or so. So one of the advantages of art is that uh, you can use, reuse the materials even on site. So the uh, major building material uh, component is stabilized at 4% uh, uh, cement stabilized and the rest is uh, lateritic soil. So the bricks, the main bricks, we just talked about it and we start building fence, uh, start playing around uh, building fence uh, around the building instead of uh, molding more materials, we just more bricks. We just use the what will we'll have uh, been termed uh, debris. We use it to uh, uh, do defense and we create all sorts of design to it. So, and we even uh, constructed um, uh, some flower pot from the bricks. All we did was just cement it and then put uh, mosaic ties on that. And um, talking about innovative practices, it brings more projects. From these projects, we did this other project. Um, so this was around 1999. This is residential building. And then we did the mocks. This mocks, um, just as we said, clients have a lot of power. There are a lot of things that they change. For example, like the coping, uh, there was a lot of arguments. But I'm glad I allowed the client to do what, uh, what they want to do. You can see there's a lot of erosion along the, uh, along the parapet. Why? Because the bricks are not well protected. And 20 something years along the line, the client is seeing, although it's late now, the children, has, um, I'm glad one of the, uh, his son was old enough to remember uh, that 
what I told them and, and is happening now. This is interior of the mox. Again, there are a lot of things they did, which is affecting it. Like you can see at the base, they painted it with uh, oil paints and it's peeling off. Uh, but it's still in use. And this is why I want to show you. So when we build our mox, the clients wanted to build, uh, it's within an estate, they only wanted to build more using um, the same bricks. But he went and bought different press, brick press. This one is interlocking, which I told him is not as strong as the one we had building. Anyway, somewhere along the line, we fell apart. And he left the bricks there. You can't believe it. Since 1999, this is 2020. Um, picture was taken in 2022, and the bricks are still intact. This is a brick I said they are not of good quality, but they are still there. So why are we saying that um, art buildings are not durable? If you do it right, it should be durable. So thank you very much. Uh, that's just what, what I want to uh, say. So uh, it's just about making sure that we do it right, nothing more. And doing it right required a lot of uh, thinking. And that is where collaboration have to come in. Architects, engineers, quantity surveyors have to come together and put our minds together. So I think that's it. Um, All right. Thank you. Okay. Thank Thank you very much, Dr. Shiju. That was a very interesting presentation. Um, it was good to see the, those visuals, you know, of the um, examples of earthing, earthing material. We, we have to go now into the last round because we are really running over time. So we'll, we will start, look, um, we want to discuss now about recommendations um, and um, sort of um, vision for, you know, the, the way forward in terms of the construction materials um, industry in Africa. Um, I'm going to be, I'm, I'm going to ask a specific question, um, really, um, regarding innovation. Um, are we doing enough to implement innovation with construction materials? Um, specifically, I'm referring to things like, you know, the willingness of the industry to um, to innovate, really, and other pre uh, product stakeholders to innovate. Investment in inno innovation and uptake of innovation by the um, by the industry. Um, Professor Mohammed, do you want to go on that? You're, thank you're you very much. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, thank you very much. I infrastructure is a generic term used for uh, infrastructure like hospital building or hospitals, roads and door and all that. They are usually of high capital intensity. So usually governments are called to take charge of this. So mm. I think well, I, we must carry the government along, policymakers. We must carry them along for us to be able to implement these recommendations, especially sustainable uh, materials like research findings on how we can make our uh, uh, make use of material alternative materials in construction. We must carry the government along because they are, they are the ones that spend all the money. No, for example, people have big houses on streets, but they cannot build the roads. They don't build the roads. So we need, you must carry government along to be able to implement many of these research findings so that they can, when we practice them, then people will be encouraged. Once the government approves it, and we saw, and uh, they see results, then people will be encouraged to adopt the same thing. So that's the that's what I really we must carry the government along. We must get them to accept our, the, our research findings. We must encourage them to implement, use them to put to put to do government projects. Once they do that, others will follow. Thank you very much. All right, thanks, Professor Mohammed. If 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 I understand you correctly, you're, you're essentially saying that um, collaboration between the government, private sector, educational institutions, etc., is very, very key to um, yes. fostering growth and innovation in construction materials um, exactly. in, in the construction sector. Okay. Now, that's very interesting because um, I believe that um, Ronald, sorry, I keep on picking on Ronald, but um, <laughs> um, 
Rona has a particular example, I think, which he wants to share in terms of government and private sector collaboration, um, which might be um, a perfect, well, might be a template or might be something that we might look into. Ronald, do you want? You're, you're on mute, sorry. I'm sorry, I keep on forgetting. <laughs> yeah, so uh, the example that I have is, uh, is a collaboration or partnership between uh, the government of Colombia and the uh, private uh, sector. So particularly the government through uh, the Chamber of Commerce, uh, an entity called Kamakol, not Kamakol, Kamakol um, reached out to national representatives, both from governments and also private institutions and hand in hand with the International Finance Corporation uh, decided to create awareness particularly in relation to uh, green materials, green buildings and sustainability. And uh, through their works and what they were able to do, the, it created a demand for, for green buildings. That was around, uh, I think 2016. And they were able to bring up, uh, to bring on board five different local banks and offer various uh, green finance offerings. And, um, by doing that, um, the, um, the, the demand and the um, intake or, or the uptake of uh, green buildings shoot up from 0% to around 20% in a span of four years. So that's between 2017 to 2021. So clearly, um, such kinds of collaborations help. And through this uh, interaction, the government of Colombia also released what was the first green building code. And um, this has really helped them. They've even been able to <coughs> release what it's called a green bond around 2017. And I think that was the first to be done around Latin America. So clearly um, when all parties uh, come, come to the table um, equally, uh, there's an opportunity, there's a great deal of opportunity to gain. And uh, we can learn a lot from Colombia, especially in regards to sustainability. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much, um, Ronald. Um, I mean, so Professor Mohammed has emphasized the issue of government uh, collaboration or government championing, you know, um, these issues um, in terms of the use, using construction materials and alternative construction materials, um, sustainability, um, et cetera. And clearly that's very possible as um, Ronald has given an example, um, but uh, you know that's th there's a whole field of work around that that needs to be done. Um, I, I want the Professor Mohammed saying that we need to make government aware, but there's, there's, lot, there's lots of work to be done around that. Um, and I, that might be the subject of another, another webinar in itself, you know. Um, so we we'll just we we'll just move forward, but thank you very much for your um you know for those comments. I just want to end the um webinar um well the panelist discussion before I move into the question and answers. Um, I'm going to go around each panelist now, um, and I'm going to ask each panelist a question, and the question is this: I will now I, I want each panelist to state one thing that will change in the African construction industry in relation to construction materials if they had the um, opportunity and the authority to do so. So the one thing you would change in the African construction industry in relation to construction materials, if you had the authority and the opportunity to do so. So I'll start from the bottom right-hand corner of my screen, probably different from your screen, but I have Grace here. Um, so I'll call on Grace, first of all. Uh, if I had the power to make my contribution to the built environment. First, I would include the study of alternative building uh, options in the universities here in Kenya. Uh, throughout my course, I think we all we talked about was uh, brick and mortar, that is the construction from concrete and, 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 and bricks. Uh, and we only touched in passing uh, alternative building methods. Over, over the years, I've realized that very few professionals really understand what alternative building materials and sustainability is all about. 
So currently, of course, you will see a lot of uh, noise around sustainability, biophilic design, green design, but it just stops at that. It stops at the webinar. No one really moves to teach now the youth who are really more supposed to learn about this because the current environment would affect them more. No one is really driving the point home to the new professionals. So you'll find the older generation, of course, all they know is brick and mortar and no offense, but uh, now when it's time for you to start uh, educating them about alternative building methods, in my case, when I start educating them about shipping containers, most of them, all they think about is the box that is usually on trailers and nothing more to it. So it forces me as of now to make a lot of noise around it here locally. And I try to use these same social media platforms that my age mates are more keen on to just basically uh, sensitize people about this. So if it was in my position, I would make it uh, a course in uh, units around built environment. Even if it's one, 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 one semester of pure study of alternative building methods. All right. Thank you very much for that, Grace. Um, I'll call on Ronald next. Um, please keep it very short because we're running out of time. So if you can just tell us that one thing, the one thing you will do to make a change. Mm, I'd, I'd change our perception or our view of traditional and alternative building uh, materials and like um, focus more on appreciating the rich diversity and versatility of the resources that we have and trying as best and as most to use that rather than um, taking up foreign practices from other parts of the world. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, uh, Ronald. Um, Charles, you next. Well, uh, in two words, I would uh, probably have the courage to invest um, in technology because this is what will drive the change. Any change will face resistance from all the layers top down. So you need to invest so that you can really have an impact on the way things are done, on the way construction technology is currently being done. So it needs courage and it needs a premium to pay so that you can downstream get the benefits. Okay, thank you, Charles. Uh, Professor Mohammed. You're, you're on mute. You, you, you're on mute, sorry. Yeah. yeah. I would want that I, if I'm in a position, I will identify one particular research findings on alternative material and implement it commercially so that people will see it. Then they'll be encouraged to adopt it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Mohammed. And last but not the least, Dr. Shitu. Well, I, I, I would like to do a lot, but you asked me for one. <laughs> and that one thing is about the way, I mean, the collaboration between the industry and the educational institution. Um, if you look at Nigeria, for example, there is no formal institution where you train bricklayers, carpenters. We used to have them before, but now we no longer have them. So, and then that's from the bottom. So I would like to change from the bottom to the top, like the issue of collaboration between research institutions and um, businesses, for example. So that, because we have the brains there on one side and we have the implementers. And you cannot blame the businesses. Every business is set up to make profit. So they will take up a technology that they know that they can calculate their profit even before they start. Like the project I showed you, we could, when we were doing it, when we started, we could not even get a quantity surveyor that would do the costing for us. I did it myself. And of course, you would like to know whether I was I got it right or not. I got it wrong <laughs> because I'm not a country surveyor. But because we have a good client, we're able to. So that kind of collaboration, 
that's what I would like to change. Uh, not really change, I would like to develop because we don't have it. Okay, well, thank you very, very much to our distinguished panel of um, panelists, our distinguished panelists, thank you very much. Um, the floor is now open for questions. We have quite a number of questions and because we've running out of time, we obviously won't be able to take everything. So what I'm going to do um, is to pick on some of the questions and I'll sort of assign them to um, to the different um, um, panelists. Well, I guess the first question here, which I'm going to ask Dr. Shitu to answer uh, is, are there any available, um, by the way, can you see the questions? Just, just so that when I'm reading it out, I might, might be easier. I'll read it out any. I'll, I'll read the okay. question out. Okay. It says, are there any available compendium of sustainable um, biomaterials for references and subsequent application when planning a construction project? Is there any sort of a compendium reference, you know, um, out there that can be used? Um, as far as I'm aware. As far as I'm aware, there are no compendium, but there are some um, individual specific to material. I know there are uh, on earth construction, um, which was done as sometimes ago by UN Habitat. And there, is, there are some publication also by the Center for Earth Construction Technology in JOS which was set up by the French government as far back as 1992. And to, I mean, many people in Nigeria don't even know that the center exists, but it was set up um, and they were doing so well um, uh, when it started. But now, I mean, it's under National Commission for Museum and Monuments. So again, what we are talking about, lack of collaboration between industry and institutions. It's just there, just uh, another civil service uh, institution that nothing happened. So there are individual, but there is no compendium of uh, or, uh, sustainable material, but there are, uh, for different materials here and there scattered or around, as far as I'm aware. Okay, thanks. I'll, I'll ask the same question actually to Ronald, um, because I know that Ronald consults on this, um, daily so um ronald do you are there any available compendium for of sustainable biomaterials um as a reference material in planning a construction project are you aware of any in your practice well um it's not necessarily as publications but um i'd give an example that i think stretches to a lot of sub-saharan african countries um they, there's uh what we call the building council for instance like the green building council on each and every respective country so for instance like kenya kenya has has one and we have what is called the jenga green app so if you particularly go on the app and you can actually look for different materials different fixtures in relation to sustainable materials and things like that yes okay thanks um i have a number of questions on 3D printing. I'll take two of them um, and for Charles, obviously. Um, the first is, what is being done to enhance the lack of fusion in 3D printed concrete, which um, the writer here says has significant impact on its durability? Well, if Not I understand sure. it, it's, it's really the, the bond between the different layers. I mean, that's how I understand it. Obviously, mm -hmm. this is a sensitive matter. It has to do a lot with the additives that are being uh, mixed with the, with the concrete, but also, and more importantly, to the uh, uh, speed of pumping, uh, to the speed of subsequent layering of the material. So all this has to do with the end product. And for that, there are quality assurance uh, and quality control testing, strict ones, and, and I mentioned one of them, uh, which is issued lately by ASTM, to, to, to give guidance on the way, you know, the end product is to be checked and, and, and controlled on site to ensure consistency. Because obviously, if there is no bond between the different uh, or the subsequent layers, there could be uh, worry about structural integrity and, and, and durability of the, of the final material. 
Okay, thank you. Um, the other question is specifically regarding the Angola project. Um, the question is, how did the Angola 3D printing project come about? And what is the size? How many units? And how is the client supporting the technology? I think there's about three questions in one there. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I touched <laughs> upon this uh, uh, during my discussion, uh, during my presentation. Obviously, uh, it is. It is. Um, it came about through a, you know, a, 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 a local technology provider, the arm of an international technology provider who are locally established in Angola. They have they started with a dream. They are an IT company, but they were interested in in, in delivering this technology to the market. Uh, they came to us, and then we 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 joined venture together. Uh, uh, there is no clarity for now on the number of units that will be printed. It's the first project we're we're uh, currently executing for a limited number of housing units. But obviously, the plan is once this is done. Uh, to scale it to to a much larger number of, of of units, so that's all I can say at this point. Okay, there's a question specifically here for Grace. Although I think what they're asking for is your um, they need your expertise. So um, the person says they need your contribution for this sort of work in Uganda. Um, how can they reach out to you, or how can you be made available to them? Okay, uh, I'll leave my contact. In, in the in the in the comment, I'll actually answer with a message. But the current uh, uh, restriction or the current downside for us to get into the Ugandan market is transportation costs because these containers get to Kenya from Mombasa, and for us to be able to implement them in Uganda, it means we have to transport them all the way to Uganda. So it's more of a, a logistic issue that we are actually taking into consideration because we've gotten this question a few times now of people wanting us to cross borders and just go to Uganda for the same. Okay, thanks, Grace. So Grace said she's going to put her contact in the chat box or somewhere, um, and you can contact her from there. Um, we have a question here that's, um, this is for Professor Mohammed. Um, it says our experience of building with Beko wall form in Nigeria. I'm I, I'm not really sure what that is, but it must be a building system or something. In Nigeria, has identified the potential for making a uh, better use of local materials with the lower cement content for general construction. And they're asking who should we refer to for developing this form of concrete with or without fiber reinforcement. Um, I guess being the practitioner in Nigeria, you might be able to help. You know. Well, did you say DECO? It says BECO here, B-E-C-O. So maybe they meant DECO, but it says B-E-C-O wall form. I don't know what that is. Really. I, I, I don't know. I, the, the, I, okay, the, the, the person that asked the question is Mr. Robin Miller. Um, perhaps if you can I don't know, provide your contact details somewhere. We can pass it on to Professor Mohammed in Nigeria. He might be able yes, to assist. So I, I, yes, I, I'll go to answer Okay, so Mr. Robin Miller, um, if you pass on your details, we might be able to pass it on to um, to Professor Mohammed. Uh, we have another question again for you, uh, Professor Mohammed. Um, yes. looking, looking at the population of a country like Nigeria, this person says, and the demand, the person says the demand for cements, corn cob ash, and other agricultural waste ashes would not meet 10% of the demand. Um, I'm not sure what they're asking. I think they are either saying that um, the use of corn cob ash and other wastes uh, might not be sufficient, you know, um, to as alternative materials, you know. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. really, they, they are usually as partial replacements not full one. Partial replacement of uh, this material. There are very many of them. There are a lot of wastes, a lot of wastes. So it's partial mm -hmm. replacement. It's not full replacement. I think yeah, it, 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 that's feasible. We, because Hello? so if you look at how, I say, yeah, we can use them. We can use yeah. them as partial replacement, not full replacement. 
And uh, I want to say there's a specific research of phos uh, phosphoric acid stabilized rammed earth, adobe bricks. We have done a lot of work. We have research findings on use of adobe bricks. So I partial replacement, we, we, it should be okay. Partial replacement, not food, not uh, uh, entirely as a strategy. Okay, okay. Um, the last question, this is to Dr. Shitu. There's lots of other questions, by the way, but because of we've run out of time, um, I'll just direct this to Dr. Shitu. It says, there's a large labor force in Africa. Wages are really low. Instead of bringing in all kinds of prefab or other building methods, why do we not um, use the local force and try to develop the local building system to meet, for example, the sustainable standards and develop a system in which the local labor force benefits? Uh, yeah, that's that's true. And um, the good thing is that um, um, all the technology that uh, we talk about, the materials and technology we talk about today is labor intensive, so yeah. which is good news. And including when the 3D printing, yes, it's faster, but mm. it means that we'll be able to build more. So we'll build more, and when we build more, and we remember that uh, the labor force will not only be in the construction site. That will be put out with fabricating the windows, the doors, and then if we expand our industry so that even the the uh, things like the WC, the wash hand basin, the bath, the shower, and everything is manufactured locally. So it means as Charles is building more 3D houses, those uh, uh, manufacturers of components and parts will get will get more supplies, and that will uh, impact the uh, the labor force uh, drastically. So that is even one. That is the, even the high spec. The 3D printing is the high spec, and uh, this mm -hmm. and that. So there will be more, um, uh, more units of houses that will build it, more units of construction that will build it. And as they expand, hopefully, as Charles says, start thinking of maybe um, how to improve the tensile strength, so that even one day we will have 3D printed stadium. Uh, you understand? So all these things, um, at the end of the day it enhances human performance. And as we perform better, there will be more productivity. Okay. All right, thank I said that would be the last, but I'm going to throw two, because there's lots and lots of questions here about the 3D printing. So Charles, I'm just going to throw two to you. Um, I think they might be pretty short in terms of answering, I think. But first of all, if the building shape is regular with no curves, or no form complications, will the 3D printing still be cost effective? Well, I mean, uh, the, the, the straight answer is depends how many units we have to build. If we're talking one unit, obviously conventional way is the shortest, the easiest, and, and obviously it'll cost less. If we're talking a repetition, probably hundreds of thousands of the same unit, then the time will take over and, you know, the number of labor you need to put in place will factor in. And obviously, you know, 3D printing on the long run will lead or yield savings, no doubt. Thank you. Um, another question. Can this technology, 3D printing, can it be used in the production of continuously reinforced concrete pavements? Well, I haven't seen this myself. Uh, I'm sure there are, you know, people interested in developing this, exploring potential applications, uh, <coughs> but, but uh, I'm not aware of this myself. Yeah. Okay. And the last one, the last of the last, what is the maximum concrete strength tested on the models? Typically, yeah. we, we, we get the 30 to 40, 45 MPA. So that, that's significant because of the amount of cement we put in and the additives uh, that serve for workability, pumpability, but we get in return a dense concrete. And typically, while we don't need as much for a single or double story uh, buildings, particularly when it's all bearing wall system, but we get 30 to 40. So can, we can easily get to 45, I believe, uh, you know, with, with the readily available cement, wherever we, we, we apply the, the technique to. Okay. Now, thank you very much, Charles. And with that, we'll come to the end of the question and answer session. We still have quite a number of questions. And what we are going to try to do is to try to um, 
answer um, after this um, as many of the questions as we can. Um, I, I might be giving some of the panelists homework, if you don't mind, <laughs> which means that you might be receiving some questions and so that we'll then um, refer it to, um, to, the, um, sure. to the panelists, sorry, to the attendees. Um, we've got the contact details of the person who wants to contact you, Professor Mohammed. so we'll direct that to you. Um, and you can then liaise with him or, or give him his contacts here. Um, so we've come to the end of the webinar and I want to say a very, very big thank you to um, everybody for um, attending the webinar. Um, I'd like to say that you should be on the lookout for our next webinar um, um, in our Building a Better Africa series. We'll be posting the details of the, um, the date and details of the next webinar on the events page of our uh, website, uh, which I think Chinedu has just put on the um, group chat. Um, so you can see, you're able to see there what the uh, details of the next webinar are um, when we do it. Um, thank you very much, everybody, for coming. Um, thank you very much to the distinguished panelists, and thank you very much to the audience. Um, have a good evening, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.